Ose Shalom, what a wonderful text. The maker of peace on high will surely create peace for us and for all Israel. And we say Amen. Or in another translation, the creator of harmony in the spheres will surely create harmony for us and for the whole world. The Alkolyo Shvete Vel. And we say Amen. These words occur over and over in our liturgy. It's the last paragraph in the full Kaddish. It ends every silent Amidah, and it's there at the end of the Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals. Sometimes it's just chanted or even spoken, but there are also many, many great tunes. And one of the greatest is the one that you are about to hear. And after the performance, Stay tuned for a discussion with the composers and soloists on the video, Cantor Jeff Klepper and Rabbi Danny Freelander. I'm so glad that we have with us today Cantor Jeff Klepper and Rabbi Dan Freelander, the composers and performers of the piece that we just heard. Thanks for being with us today. First of all, Jeff, what inspired you to become a singer-songwriter, and was it always Jewish material that you were doing? Um, I was very lucky and fortunate to um, have my family join a synagogue in Manhattan where I grew up called the Stephen Wise Synagogue, Stephen Wise Free Synagogue. Um, the music director was a man named Abraham Wolfbinder. 
which is a name, a renowned name. And he took me under his wing at a very young age. I think I was 11 or 12 years old. You might say that that was the beginning of my education, my Jewish music education. But at the same time, I was listening to folk music because as we all know, the 1960s, early 60s was the heyday of, uh, of folk. And my particular favorite was Pete Seeger. The whole point of Pete Seeger was that everyone sings together and that when we sing together, we are more powerful, we are more invested, we are more spiritual as a community than when we sing in a solo or performance. So you combine Pete Seeger and Abraham Wolf Bender, and that's kind of where I come from. So Danny, same question to you. What inspired you to become a singer songwriter? Well, two parts to the question. First of all, I was a choir kid from the, my youngest years. I grew up at Temple Emanuel in Worcester, Massachusetts, singing in the uh, Shabbat morning choir every week, the music of Hugo Chaim Adler. I sang with the choir every week. Uh, I got promoted to the adult choir and uh, learned to sight read a lot better. And I was in every choir in my high school and uh, sang in every musical. So mu Broadway musicals and, and uh, synagogue choir, sort of the two big influences on my early musical life. Let's talk about the song now, Ose Shalom. Um, how did it come to be? It was 1980, 81. We had both graduated and went off on our careers. And my first stop was Israel, where I became a, um, I guess you could call a resident cantor of the Leo Beck High School in Haifa, which had been founded by German Jews. And of course, German Jews back in the 1960s meant reform. There was a rabbi who had made Aliyah, an American rabbi named Robert Samuels, who I had met briefly. And he said, Jeff, I know that you love to write songs. And it's my fervent hope, he said to me, that you will write a lot of songs in Israel and add them to the repertoire of, uh, of progressive Jewry in Israel. And I took him took him up on the offer. But it was a very prolific year for Jeff. And some of the uh, most important songs that we do still were started out that year. Um, but uh, this, the song we're talking about tonight, Ose Shalom, um, was not originally, the melody was not originally written by Jeff for Ose Shalom. Um, Jeff, you want to tell that story? I <laughs> read well. It was the fall of 1981. I had been in Israel maybe a month or two, and we were preparing for the high holidays, and I was going to be the chazan, the cantor of the high holiday service at the high school, which had a chapel on a beautiful hill overlooking the Mediterranean in Haifa. So the original text was a prayer that is in the Amidah. It's a very important prayer. V'tim lo chata. Adonai levadecha, al kol maasecha, bahar tzion, mishkan kvodecha, uv Yerushalayim, ir kodshecha. So I set it to music. What did I know? I sit down with my guitar, I go over it and over it and over it uh, at home, and I came up with a melody. So how, how did it change with the new lyrics? Well, Jeff comes home with this great amount of repertoire, and I'm really interested to say, oh, we've got to really learn some of this stuff and start performing it and enter it into our repertoire. Um, but as I listen to this extraordinary melody, um, I realize this is not a text that, that's going to make it in our market, it, that's going to resonate with people we perform for, for, for really for, for two reasons. One is, this is the early 1980s, the reform movement is just becoming a Zionist movement. Mm -hmm. a, heavy, um, a heavy Zionist comment, including the rebuilding of the Mishkan in Jerusalem, which you know the movement still hasn't gotten to. Um, so that made it sort of not 
if you knew the Hebrew, it wasn't going to become a big hit in the reform movement. Uh, but the second piece was, it's, it's an extraordinary melody. It's a powerful melody. It's a power ballad, if you will. And um, we needed a text that was, that this, this is a melody that it had to be used over and over and over on a weekly basis by people. Mm. Um, and third reason I'll add is, um, again, this is 1982, um, there were no real popular alternatives to Nurit Hirsch's Ose Shalom yet. If you went to a synagogue and they were going to sing Ose Shalom, Ose Shalom Bim Romav is all they would sing. And I was getting tired of it. So um, we played around with a variety of different texts to see if they would fit this melody. And Ose Shalom Bim Romav fit it perfectly. That's the beginning. Um, I'm sure there have been some memorable performances, aside, of course, from the one we did together, but what stands out in your mind of memorable performances of this Ose Shalom? Well, I have, I have two. One is um, the 1987 uh, mobilization for Soviet Jewry in Washington, D.C., in December of 87. Uh, um, we had just given a concert, I think, on a Saturday night at, at Brandeis University, and then we flew down to Washington and sang on the mall for half a million people. Mm. And this is one of the songs we sang. And, um, and uh, the second would probably be um, the choral arrangements of Ose Shalom, of which there have been a number of them. And I love choral singing, and I love to hear large choruses um, sing this song and sort of do their own covers, their own arrangements of this, um, and changing some of the chords and, um, and harmonies. So th those are the highlights. And I'd, and I'd also add singing at large conventions. Um, Jeff and I for many, many years would sing at the, the closing or night of the, or the, uh, or the uh, Friday night song session at the URJ Biennial. Um, that was held in a convention hall with four or 5,000 people together. And we'd be leading a song session, and Ose Shalom is a perfect, another one of those perfect, put your arms around everybody and, and sing your hearts out song, um, with or without choir. And that's always been a highlight, how, how emotionally involved the, uh, the, the congregation or audience can get. There's something as we've talked about, special about a song and when a particular melody and a text fits together and and creates a its own special magic. But when you add choral harmonies to it, either composed or impromptu, mm -hmm. uh, that adds uh, adds to the the beauty. Um, it you you feel like you are not touching the ground anymore. You feel that you are being lifted up. The testimony to the power of music to create community. We had been experimenting with music in those years, those early years. And as I have said before, I'm not ashamed of this. A lot of our musical influence was secular. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, James Taylor. And we incorporated some of those sounds in our music because those were American sounds. And then I guess we turned them into American Jewish sounds. Yeah, you, you were creating a fusion. But something very special had been happening in Israel musically after the Six Day War. You had the American folk and rock mm -hmm. that I referred to influencing mm -hmm. the traditional, traditional, so to speak, music of Israel, which already has influences of European and Arabic and Middle Eastern and so forth. So people like Ari Einstein and the uh, group Pugi were playing songs that, to me, were the epitome of what uh, the popular Jewish music could be, which is only to say, by living in Israel for a year, I was able to absorb that. And when I came home and continued to write, my music was different. It sounded much more Jewish, whatever that is. 
I'll add one more that's sort of a coda to this. The tolerance level of the um, Israeli students and faculty at, at the Leo Beck High School for changing melodies was far higher than it was in American congregations or even in American summer camps. Um, they recognized that composers write new things and they didn't fight it. And um, those of us who labor in North America know that it's a very somewhat uh, conservative or reactionary community. They, they, they know what they like and they like what they know. And that's a challenge I think for any composer and uh, the Israel year, certainly for Jeff, provided him with the, the space and the acceptance to, to spread his wings. Jeff and Danny, thank you so much for this great music. Um, in these disturbing times, these words and this inspiring setting do give us a ray of light and a message of hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes.